<laughs> All right, that music's got your attention. We don't have the opening completed yet, but maybe that's the music we'll use. Anyway, uh, we just had an election, and uh, it took the election to wake me up to the fact that, uh, you know, I got complacent. I start thinking that everybody's like me or my friends or my viewers. They understand what's going on. And, and then, of course, the results of the election showed that, uh, no, that isn't true. There's still a whole bunch of people that just do not get it. Well, I spent a few days not connecting to the Internet at all this time. And uh, I only watched Fox News just for an experiment. And I didn't, you know, I think I learned less. I, I, I know less now than I did when I started. Uh, but I have no idea whatsoever was going on anywhere in the world except that I know that ISIS is beheading everybody and that we have to go save the world somehow. Well, uh, I don't know what to say. We, marijuana passed. Uh, at least we're getting it somewhere, you know, and you, it might have some shortcomings. And that brings me to the idea of the GMO thing that didn't pass here. Uh, what incredible stupidity you know how could the Oregon voter be swayed by the GMO money how could it be I thought by now everybody knew that it's important to label your food whether or not you have that poison in it or sometimes it might be good but the point is you should be able to decide yourself and so many people out there said no, I want somebody else to decide for me, and I'm going to trust them that they won't put anything bad in it, okay? You know, how stupid. I, I despise the people that voted against GMOs. And, you know, the lies. I'd love to see an analysis of all the lies that the GMO proponent, or, you know, the anti-labeling people put forward, you know. Oh, it's going to cost so much. It's different. Oh, you know, the biggest complaint they had was that some of the things that we do will have an exemption. So this law really doesn't help you. That's why you shouldn't have the law. Wait a minute. Go ahead and get the law and then start another little bit of legislation to correct the loopholes that might be in it. But in the meantime, yeah, whatever isn't exempted we'll get to know about. That's a step forward. Okay, if anybody out there that hears my voice right now voted to not have GMO labeling, you're a stupid asshole, okay? God, oh, sorry, I, I just, okay, well, we're going to move on here. I found out when I was on the internet the other day, I, was, I just mentioned, hey, you remember Al-Qaeda is to America just like the uh, bullies that the glass company hires to go around breaking windows at night are, you know, so that now the glass company has work during the day. Well, that's what we use Al-Qaeda for. And the guy on the internet said, where's your proof? You don't, you, uh, you don't make an assertion. You don't say anything. You know, well, okay, here is a really good video. You should probably record this and play it over and over and over again. I still play it over and over again. It's some of the best scholarly work. Uh, Professor Michael uh, Chusadowski, okay, I hope I said it right. Anyway, from Global Research, tv.org, I think it is. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and play this. It's 24 minutes, and I'll come right back. I think the world is presently at the crossroads of the most serious crisis in modern history. The United States and its indefectible uh, British ally have launched a military adventure which threatens the future of humanity. This is not an understatement. It is not something necessarily which is 
portrayed in the mainstream media because war in the mainstream media is portrayed as a humanitarian undertaking, as a peace-building, uh, um, anti-terrorist uh, uh, operation. But in fact, if we look at recent developments, particularly with regard to the militarization of Eastern Europe, particularly the deployment of NATO forces on Russia's doorstep, the civil war which is occurring in Ukraine, but concurrently the wars in the Middle East, particularly the escalation which is currently occurring in Syria and Iraq, and the fact that that whole area now becomes an open border with the possibility of a regional war uh, which would extend from North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean right to Central Asia and South Asia uh, involving possibly other countries and leading to an integration of existing war theaters. We have, we have a war in Iraq, we have a war in Syria, we have threats directed against Iran, we have a situation in Palestine which is, which is part of this process, we have uh, an undeclared war of the United States directed against Pakistan with the drone attacks in the northwest Pakistan. And uh, at the same time, the United States uh, has deployed its military forces in virtually every region of the world with the, with the command, the regional command structures. Uh, U.S. Pacific Command is in charge of the so-called um, Asia pivot, the pivot to Asia, which is, uh, which is part of the military agenda and which essentially consists in, uh, in threatening China. Uh, we have a process of militarization in the South China Sea. Uh, in, at, at this very moment, the United States with its uh, allies are building uh, U.S. sponsored military facilities. I refer specifically to Jeju Island, which is located just opposite Shanghai, and where they're, they're in the process of building a military base at this very moment. Uh, legally, formally, it is part of the Korean, South Korean military arsenal, but in actual practice, it is a U.S. military base because the United States also has a defense cooperation agreement with uh, uh, with Korea. And in fact, uh, we see the evolution of what we might call the globalization of war, uh, where, um, first of all, the United States is using alliances, uh, not only within NATO, but extending beyond NATO, uh, to wage war on, or at least to threaten, uh, a certain number of countries, but specifically at this particular juncture, uh, the, they are threatening Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, and of course they're waging a war in Iraq and Syria. These are wars of conquest. They're not, uh, they have nothing to do with going after the Islamic State rebels. Uh, and in fact, the whole Justification for these wars are borders on absurd, because we know and it's well documented that the ISIL, the Islamic State, is a construct of U.S. intelligence. Uh, it was supported and financed uh, by the United States uh, and its allies, including Qatar, Saudi Arabia, from the very outset of the war in Syria in, two, in March 2011. It, uh, it, was, um, it was, in fact, built with a view to uh, confronting the armed forces of the government of Bashar al-Assad. It was re responsible for countless atrocities. And the architects of that Islamic State are 
of course, the United States of America. And if we look at the history of, of Al-Qaeda uh, and Al-Qaeda-affiliated organizations, we see without exception that US intelligence, together with its partners, the, 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 the British uh, MI6, uh, Israeli Mossad, the Pakistani ISI, the Saudi intelligence, that all these entities, without exception, in the Middle East, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, all these entities are what in intelligence parlance are called intelligence assets. They are instruments of US intelligence and they are at the same time the foot soldiers of the Western military alliance. They are used to destabilize sovereign states, to create chaos. Um, that was the case in Syria in the course of the last few years, starting in March 2011. They were, uh, they were involved in terrorist acts against the sovereign state. And more recently, uh, the United States and its allies now proclaim that ISIL is an independent uh, entity and we have to go after it, and that it is threatening the security of the United States of America, and that the various countries of the Western Military Alliance, namely NATO, uh, must endorse this new phase of the global war on terrorism and go after the ISIL, knowing that the ISIL, first of all, are created by the Western Military Alliance, but not only that, they have Western military advisors, they have special forces within their ranks, and that the whole ritual of actually going after them is in fact uh, a pretext for the destruction of Syria and Iraq, specifically destroying the economic infrastructure, the oil economy, the refineries. So that in fact, how do you destroy a country? Well, you destroy its economy. You destroy its institutions. And the actions which are currently taking place and are directed theoretically against ISIL are in fact resulting in the destruction of oil refineries, industrial, uh, industrial uh, facilities and so on, residential housing, and of course the killing of the, the countless killing of civilians. So that we're not dealing with the contours of a so-called uh, counter-terrorism operation or humanitarian undertaking. Uh, we're dealing with a war of conquest, and behind this war of conquest there are very uh, important economic interests in the oil industry, in the military industrial complex, the biotech conglomerates, uh, and of course the media. And the media is there to falsify the underlying realities. So we, we have to understand that this war can only succeed if it is coupled with extensive media propaganda, where the, where the news and, and uh, television and so on are there to support the lies and fabrications. But there's another element. Um, we have noticed that going after ISIL, the, uh, the, the Islamic State, is part of a broad consensus which the United States has attempted to build through various meetings um, in Geneva at the United Nations Security Council with a view to mobilizing the support of its allies. In a bitter irony, the, the US Congress, the British Parliament, the French Assemblée Nationale in chorus said we are supportive of this global war on terrorism. We're going to go after these enemies of Western civilization. And they, they do it in a way um, which is, in fact, it's nothing new, but it, it, has a, it has a new dimension to it in the sense that not a single member of parliament in Britain has actually op opposed this uh, well, there, there were a couple of exceptions, has opposed this, this military agenda. In other words, it's a consensus. It's, it, the lie becomes the truth. This is not a war against ISIL. It is a war against Syria and Iraq and Iran, 
with, in other words, the road to Tehran goes through Damascus and Baghdad, and it is largely a war of conquest, and in the eyes of public opinion, uh, the architects of this war, what they need is a pretext and a justification. And they, they build the pretext and justification um, by presenting ISIL as an enemy of the Western world, which has to be eradicated. If they wanted to eradicate ISIL, they could do it almost immediately simply by bombing their convoy of Toyota cars in the desert between Syria and, and, and Iraq. It's open territory. All you need is to bomb them. And it would have been a, a 20 minute operation. It could have been done uh, from aircraft and so on and so forth. But the whole thing was orchestrated. It was, it was understood that this uh, entity would become enemy number one in the same way as Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden were enemy number one in the wake of 9-11. So we're, we, have a, we have a certain doctrine of, of, uh, in the evolution of the global war on terrorism. Uh, in the wake of 2001, uh, recalling the 9-11 attacks, uh, Afghanistan was pinpointed as uh, having attacked the United States of America. Uh, it, the statements were not pre precisely in that direction, uh, but in effect, Afghanistan was, was tagged as a state sponsor of terrorism, and consequently this led in early October of 2001 to the invasion and occupation of of Afghanistan on the grounds that Afghanistan was threatening the United States of America um, on September 11, 2001. Now, that ideology, of course, goes back much further to the Soviet-Afghan war, uh, where we know that, that, in fact, the United States uh, had actually participated in the recruitment of the Mujahideen, the Al-Qaeda Mujahideen, who were used um, to wage a war against the secular government. It was a secular government. Afghanistan was a secular country with secular institutions. And uh, ultimately, it, was, it had an alliance with the Soviet Union. And then, uh, ultimately, the objective was to establish a US sphere of inf influence in that region. Uh, and um, eventually, what has occurred and what is occurring in other parts of the Middle East and Central Asia is the transformation of uh, secular uh, countries into, into Islamic, uh, into Islamic uh, uh, states uh, or caliphates. Uh, but bear in mind, all that is part of a US intelligence agenda. Political Islam is not the product of, uh, of Middle East societies. It is the product of a, of a carefully designed intelligence agenda, which goes back to the Soviet-Afghan war, or even before that, and which consists in creating uh, uh, an Islamic state. And, and we call that regime change. Uh, how do we know that? Because the textbooks which were used uh, in, the, in the Quranic schools and the training manuals uh, which were used to indoctrinate the Mujahideen uh, in the Pakistan and Afghanistan were printed by, in the United States and were produced by the University of Nebraska. Um, we know that all those terrorist entities, whether it's, Al whether it's uh, uh, the ISIL or, or Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb or the Libya Islamic Fighting Group uh, or Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia um, uh, or the, the various uh, entities which uh, have spread across Sub-Saharan Africa, all of those Al-Qaeda-affiliated entities are uh, 
essentially intelligence assets. They are not agents of the US government, but they are manipulated and controlled and financed um, by the United States and its allies. And we are in a situation where Saudi Arabia and Qatar previously funded the Islamic State rebels when they were fighting against the government of Bashar al-Assad, and now they are called to go and fight against them. So we're in, in a very absurd situation. Um, and uh, the, the absurdity is known and understood, but at the same time it is accepted uh, as an unbending truth. Namely, you accept the fact that the global war on terrorism goes, is, means that you go after Al-Qaeda, uh, knowing that Al-Qaeda, in fact, is a creation of US, uh, of US intelligence. Now, if we place this evolving situation in the broader context of uh, US military involvement, uh, since the end of World War II, we initially had, of course, the Cold War era. And the Cold War era was characterized by a number of wars. Uh, but specifically, we had Korea, the, uh, starting in the early 50s. Uh, then we had, of course, we had the Vietnam War. Then we have various forms of military intervention of the United States in Indonesia, displacing a, an independent sovereign government, the, the government of Sukarno, and ultimately leading also to acts of, of criminality and massacre and killing of civilians. Um, the, the human rights record of the United States of America from the outset of the so-called post-war era is characterized by a sequence of, of wars and military interventions and military coups, the carpet bombing of North Korea during the Korean War where something of the order of one quarter of the population were wiped out and killed. It's documented by US <laughs> military sources and admitted. General Curtis LeMay said we must have killed something of the order of 20% of the North Korean population during a period of bombing. He admitted that, but in fact the figures were even much higher than that. The same thing in Indonesia, some, according to some figures, uh, uh, one million uh, communist partisans and their families were, were assassinated. The, the, the official figures of the United States are, are, are much lower, but they admit to have, having killed more than a couple of hundred thousand people during, uh, during that era. And then, of course, they blame the deaths on the victims. That has been typically the case. And then you have the interventions in addition to Vietnam and Cambodia, which are theater wars, where, where Cambodia was, was subjected to carpet bombing, where Vietnam was, uh, was uh, attacked using chemical weapons. All this is a background to today's wars and to today's atrocities. And they're part of a military agenda, which is, which is essentially geared uh, towards establishing global hegemony. Uh, and I, I should mention this global hegemony um, at this particular juncture is confronting two major nuclear powers, namely the Russian Federation as well as China. Uh, and uh, we are indeed at a very dangerous crossroads because the United States has also uh, reclassified its nuclear bombs. Uh, a new nuclear doctrine has taken shape and the so-called tactical nuclear weapons, which are considered to be small nuclear bombs, are considered to be harmless to the surrounding civilian population uh, because the explosion is underground. And by reclassifying nuclear bombs as humanitarian bombs, they, in, in effect, they have also uh, given the green light to the commanders in the war theater to use nuclear weapons as part of a, of a weapons toolbox. And it, it, the safeguards of the Cold War are no longer there. Now then you have other mechanisms because we're in an era of non-conventional warfare. You have, uh, you have the use 
of chemical and biological weapons, uh, which uh, are certainly on the, they're certainly part of the arsenal. Uh, there's the use of electromagnetic weapons, including um, environmental modification techniques, you, uh, in other words, climatic warfare, all that is there. And then you have, uh, within the realm of non-conventional warfare, you have, again, uh, processes of destabilization. You don't necessarily need to go into a country with tanks and, and armored vehicles. You can destabilize the country through various means, economic destabilization, financial destabilization, um, the, the unleashing of, of terror brigades as, as occurred in, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, and Libya, um, coupled with perhaps supportive no-fly zones and so on. But what we must understand and what humanity has to understand is that we are now in the realm of global warfare. Um, the entire world is militarized under the regional command structures and uh, this war in, a, in, a, in the real sense of the world is threatening uh, uh, humanity. How do we, how do we uh, reverse the tide? This is a very important question. How do we reverse the tide? Well, to reverse the tide, we have to dismantle the propaganda apparatus, which is the mainstream media. We have to reveal the lies. That is the fundamental, uh, it's the prerequisite. It doesn't necessarily lead to, to uh, uh, ensuring the peace, but the legitimacy of those who are proposing this war, uh, namely the President of the United States, the British Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, the French President uh, Francois Hollande, all these people are liars. And consequently, we have to reveal the lies. We have to ultimately, we can't say, Mr. President, please, would you stop bombing Iraq? No, because by doing that, we accept his legitimacy. In other words, these people are war criminals, and they have to be, they have to be, their legitimacy has to be questioned. The architects of, of these wars, as well as the whole economic underpinnings, the, the powerful financial institutions, the military uh, uh, industrial complex, namely the large defense contractors, um, the biotech conglomerates, which, uh, which are involved in the pharmaceutical industry as well as in big agriculture with genetically modified seeds. All of this constitutes the, are these, are the power brokers beha acting behind the scenes. Uh, and we have to ultimately understand that logic. And we have to also question the existing anti-war movement, which uh, in many regards has been either has been coerced, co-opted, uh, often funded by you know the Rockefellers and the Ford Foundation and so on. Well, it will say, well, we are against the war, but we support the campaign against, uh, against uh, um, terrorism so that we support counter-terrorism operations, but we are against acts of war. And we, we think that the United States uh, should be a peaceful nation. Well, the fact of the matter is that the counter-terrorism operations are part of this military agenda. So you can't say I'm against going after bin Laden or going after uh, the Iraq, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Islamic State and at the same time saying I'm against the war. The, the, the global war on terrorism constitute the ideological underpinnings of global warfare. And of course, it's based on deceit. And it's based on what we might call an inquisitorial doctrine, uh, which is in some regards uh, similar to the Spanish and French Inquisition of, of uh, uh, you know, the Middle Age uh, period, uh, uh, where you identify the heretics and then you go after them. Well, we have a little bit uh, this, this concept of saying these are evil people, we go after the evil people and so on, and we use this as a pretext for ultimately killing millions of people. And that's the, that is the, the, the historic legacy of the United States of America. This 
Yeah, okay, that's the uh, historic legacy of the United States. In other words, American exceptionalism uh, really doesn't have any basis in uh, reality. Now, that was an awful lot to try to absorb, so I recommend that you replay that many times and try to get it. You know, if you don't get it, if you don't understand everything that he was just telling you, then you really don't understand what's going on. Now, um, here you see two books that I just recently got. This is Classified Woman. I've had a copy of that. For, I mean, this one is Classified Woman. I've had a copy of that for a long time. That's the one that talks about the trials and tribulations that Sibel Edmonds went through when she tried to uh, blow the whistle through regular channels at the FBI and they're per following persecution. She's labeled the most gagged woman in history, most classified woman in history. Uh, but recently she wrote a fiction book here, The Lone Gladio. It's based on Operation Gladio that uh, you should know about from other shows. Um, well, we're going to jump into the middle of a BoilingFrogsPost.com roundtable discussion. It's, it involves Sibel Edmonds, James Corbett, and uh, a couple of other guys that you will get to know if you start watching, you know, going to Boiling Frogs Post. I recommend it highly. And over here, uh, you'll, you'll see these three books are going to be mentioned at the end of the uh, clip that we're about to see. And these are the uh, Chalmers Johnson trilogy, the Blowback tri trilogy. Now they were talking about Blowback and uh, I happen to agree exactly with Sibel Edmonds on this one. Uh, these aren't unintended consequences. You know, everything you're seeing, including the fact that we now actually have enemies, is not an unintended consequence. They're playing it off like it is. So we're just going to go right into this. Uh, this will just about take us out. I'll come back just before the end of the show with a few more comments. That would offend our sensibilities. But of course you can parade these beheaded journalists out and, and show them a million times a day until we think this is the most pressing issue on the face of the planet. So again, it's what we are not being shown is not only more uh, equally important, but probably more important than what we are actually being shown. Well, I want to address the question Sibel posed about blowback. <clears throat> and on one level, I certainly appreciate what you're saying, that we shouldn't use blowback to describe things that are probably intentional. But I do think that this is a multi-layered story and that there is a legitimate use of the term blowback when you talk about the failed strategy of the so-called surge, which separated Sunni and Shia in an effort to tamp down the civil war that has since uh, re-erupted in Iraq. Uh, I, I do believe that we're experiencing blowback from the debathification, uh, the marginalization of Sunnis early in the occupation of Iraq. And so I, 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 under, I take your point that there are intentional uh, objectives and, and initiatives by the United States and some of our allies that don't, uh, you know, properly fall under the term blowback. And I do understand your irritation when it's misapplied. But I think that we're paying a price, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for the detention and uh, torture regimes that we employed. Uh, we're seeing that used against us now. And I do consider that a form of blowback because it was simply stupid for the United States to uh, employ those tactics, and we are paying a price for it. And, and again, I would legitimately put that uh, under the proper definition of blowback. Okay, well, I, I have a comeback for that one because let's say that is true, which I don't believe it's the case because... Um, there is this saying, it's an English-American saying, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Is that, this, is that how it goes? Not according because... to Bush, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, think about it. Because we have been saying this, okay, and the analysts on CNN have been talking about what you just talked about for the past half century, okay? 
they, they, we have had so many analysts coming in all mainstream media and saying we had even blowback because we installed Shah regime there, okay, uh, the, the kingdom there, and because of that this happened. Well, if that were the case, Peter, if you have it over half a century once or twice and three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times, eight times, 15 times, 30 times, 50 times, then you say, what the fuck, okay, excuse my language here. I mean, you can't fall back on that blowback for goddamn 50 years, okay? And then come and say, I, we don't know why it didn't work. This redrawing of the maps, okay, using the sects and the tribes and the Sunnis and Shias and the curse against each other, we've been doing it and we have had a lot of blowback because those blowbacks are intended. Because if they were not, you do it once and twice and 50 times and 100 times, you won't do it again. If that was the case, we wouldn't continue after 9-11 supporting Saudi Arabia. Can you imagine the blowback we're going to see in Saudi Arabia? I mean, we have seen nothing with Syria and Iraq. When the Saudi, the population, okay, when they really rise up, and, and, and they get rid of this despicable kingdom regime that is installed there by the United States, protected in place by the United States, you're going to see the biggest bloodshed of our time as far as Middle East is. And it's happening. It's in the corner. Do you think there is anyone, anyone in the United States government, in the State Department, in the CIA, who doesn't see this, who doesn't expect this? If that was blowback, at least after 9-11 would have said, we're not going to do this because how many times are you going to suffer a blowback of the exact same thing? That leaves a second option. And that means all these people are totally crazy. Okay. That's why they keep doing the same thing. Okay. Which I don't think it holds true. Or the only other alternative is it is intentional. It is intended. The vision here of Iraq with Sunnis and Shias and the Kurds, right now, that's exactly what the United States is doing. And I had the same conversation with one person, you know, he's a Kurdish person in, in that region. And he was saying, you know something? Actually, we really appreciate what the United States is doing. Finally, they're helping us, and with all the stuff they're going to give us, we have some other objectives, because these guns that we are getting, they have other enemies as well, okay? The Kurds, so there are Kurds in Iran, there are Kurds in, you know, parts of, you know, the southern part of Turkey, so we have plans, and we love it, and I told this man, this, this very nice, you know, informed in many levels, uh, but emotional Kurdish person, I said, how many times do you have to be used? Because they always use the Kurds whenever it's convenient for a very short period of time, right? The United States, the NATO, okay? They do that. And then when they finish, when the job is finished, they turn their backs. And let's say if it's Turkey who's going to go, go and massacre them in tens of thousands, they won't even lift a finger. So it's temporary. And these same people are going to come after you. Or when others come after you, they're going to make sure they, the others have the green light. So no. I absolutely, absolutely believe that none of these are blowbacks that are not intended. And if it is intended, if these are intended, which they are, it is not a blowback. Blowback has to be unintended. By nature, there is no other kind of blowback there. Maybe we can find a different terminology. And I want to give a quick, very quick term. Uh, Persian Iranian belief it's like an idiom mixture with folk tale they they have this saying they say don't ever leave the roofer alone in the roof for the repair okay and here where the folk tale comes from they have flat flat roofs in Iran okay they are not you know the the the, the slanted roofs and and with the bricks and and it's one of the businesses that especially historically been there it's a roof they go because some of these bricks come loose, it causes leakage, and they, they repair it. So the folk tales goes that when the roofer, you know, in this particular city or village goes there, because he's called to repair a couple of things, on his way out, if he's not washed by the house owner, he's going to go and loosen up several other of these brick pieces so that two weeks later he's called again. This is how the roofer maintains his business, okay? And especially if you're looking at smaller areas, okay, 
So if everything is fixed so well, he may go for a year and a half not having anything repaired. So he actually induces problems so that he would be called. And they are very good at it, supposedly. Tactically, they are doing it. So it will come loose in two weeks, they will be called. This is exactly what we have when we have the real deep state that is made up the military industrial complex and the oil and the financial institution. Look, their existence, their expansion, okay, besides existence and survival and expansion, all of these, okay, depend on the war industry. They want wars, expansion, colonialism. This is the colonialism. There is nothing different. When we have bases in Afghanistan, that's modern colonialism. Nobody would disagree with that. So we have to induce war. We have to have these beheadings. If, if it doesn't happen, we have to artificially induce it. Because once we do that, look at their stock prices, okay? Look at the expenditure on the military industrial complex. The more wars we have, the more conflicts we have all over the world. And in most cases, we sell to both sides, okay? When you look at both sides, whether they are getting these guns and whatever from the black market or if they are given as subsidiaries, you know, uh, by the United States, who wins? Who wins in these scenarios, in these wars, okay? Is it a blowback for those people? This is intended. This is exactly what they want. And guess what else they want? Police state also increases that expenditure. So when we have those terror attacks, okay, like Boston bombing and, and that, that was induced, that was completely staged, that was false flag, okay, it was. I, I, I believe 100% that it was. When you have the metro bombing in, 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 in UK, guess who's selling? You're going to put more x-ray machines in the airports, and you're going to have more of these checkpoints. You're going to have more border control. You have to fatten up, expand this all institutions, okay? Create jobs that otherwise are not being created in a country that is bankrupt, okay? Right now, the war machine, even though we are borrowing, is sustaining this, this rotten economy, okay? You take that away, it won't be, and you call it blowback, no, they are people who are big time profiting from it, and it doesn't fall into their lap by coincidence. It's exactly the same as those roofers. You go and do this stuff with the Sunnis, and you do tweak this thing with the Kurds, and you do train these people, the Syrian freedom fighters, rebel in Turkey and Jordan, and send them there. You do all those stuff because you have intended consequences. And as a pop analyst, you take Take it from here. I wanted to add just quickly that, yeah, that, well, I think what you were describing is that the problem reaction solution strategy, which I think I think our, our listeners are probably in, in tune with. But uh, one thing that I wanted to mention, though, I think you were absolutely right. One, one point that you made that, that I really wanted to highlight was that these strategies are not, at this point, they're not creating the police state. They are sustaining, maintaining the police state, in large part, because you just mentioned, because it did create thousands of jobs and they won't, those people want to keep their jobs and they want to keep those dollars, those federal dollars flowing into the DEA, the FBI, the DHS, and all the, especially the border area. Jesus, they, have, they would have, the border would have no economy whatsoever if it were not for the Department of Homeland Security and the growing surveillance and police state. And so that's, that's completely right on. I wanted to just offer on the blowback point, perhaps a little bit of a middle ground, because if I understood Peter correctly, I think what you were saying was that there, there is such a thing as unintended consequences, right, when it, on, a, on a small scale. Because after all, we're talking about human action, and you can't 100% predict what human beings are going to do. But I think on a large scale, on a big picture, I think you're absolutely right about that. I, I, I'm not a subscriber of incompetence theories and coincidence theories. So when you see this happening over and over and over again on that, on that, on that big scale, then yeah, I, I absolutely would agree that 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 you cannot call that blowback. If you if you do, then you're either misinterpreting it, I believe, or just being duplicitous in a way. Um, also, uh, I wonder, oh, there, oh, there was one other quick point that this is kind of a going back to something else we talked about. But if if I could just go back to the point on uh, uh, Islamic terror being used as a marketing tool uh, and the comparisons that you made, Sabelle with how this is reported versus how, uh, you know, you would never in a million years see those headlines you described about, you know, Jewish terrorists or Christian terrorists or so on and so forth. I think the last time that I can remember, 
Uh, a headline even coming close to something like that would be 1995, the Oklahoma City bombing with Timothy McVeigh. There may have been a headline saying, you know, Christian whatever, uh, but it was always paired with, you know, extremist <laughs> or, you know, right wing fringe, nut job Christian, whatever, all these kind of qualifiers before uh, Christian. And so I, I just wanted to highlight that because I, I can't think of another example besides that. Maybe you guys could could help me out with that, but I, I honestly cannot think the of one. The only other example I can think of is it happened when we had those uh, abortion clinics bombing and it was attributed to Christian ultra-right-wing extremists that right. engaged in this that was short-lived. So that's the second only example that I can think of. Yeah, and it was used the same way. It was it, for the same ends, ultimately, to expand the police state, to drum up uh, all this fear about terrorism. And in fact, that was uh, after Oklahoma City was when uh, Bill Clinton attempted to introduce what would have what became known as the Patriot Act. It was ex the, the same legislation. Uh, I, I suppose it, it, the effect was not large enough to push that through at the time, and then came 9-11, and we all know what happened after that. So just wanted to, again, bring that up just for, for context. James? Well, I don't have a lot to add to, what to what's been said already, except for the fact that on the blowback note, it's interesting to note that the same people who push the blowback narrative are the same people who cheer-led for every invasion that led to the so-called blowback that they're now lament lamenting, including uh, Amy Goodman and all of these other cheerleaders for the war state who were cheerleading on, let's get Gaddafi in Libya, let's, let's go into Syria, look at Assad. And now they're like, oh, look at the blowback, oh, this is so horrible. <laughs> Horrible. And it's just another example. How long will people continue to listen to the same people who cheerlead for the war state and then pretend to be surprised by the consequences of it rather than listening to the actual alternatives like the people uh, right. here in this conversation who were warning about this before the Libyan invasion, before what happened this in Syria? Exactly, we were right all along. Exactly. We were right before it even happened. But now the people who were wrong all along are the ones who are going to be listened to by a lot of misled people who believe that they're listening to some sort of alternative voice and Oh, and the guess blowback. What? Oh, the humanity. Guess what, James? The the funny thing is, I, I, not funny as in ha-ha funny, but funny yeah. thing is those people who have done it the most happen to be the ones who pose in the pseudo-alternative media, not even mainstream media. The former CIA analysts saying, yeah, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And it was blowback. And they are playing the alternative. There is nothing alternative about the so-called ex-CIA analysts some kind of like anonymous Mike Schur, oh my goodness, such an alternative point of view he's providing. It is actually furthering exactly the same agenda. Or Peter, I mean, that was one of the things that I was just simmering with the last uh, interview we, you had with Ray McGovern. I mean, you know, and these guys, these women, Samantha, and these bad people are making Obama do it. And making Obama do it, it's like, okay, I understand you campaign for Obama, okay? Second time, not the first time. <laughs> not the first time. Everybody was fucked up and stupid, okay? Second time, all right? Fool me twice and shame on me. It's like shame on you a billion times. It never was they made Bush do it. Bush did it. It was the Bush and Cheney. These two were the entire face of the deep state. They are the forefront men did it. To this day, okay, this drug is coming out, and that really pisses me off, Peter. That's why I cannot respect, I cannot promote this man. He says, he just, they make Obama, and then they pressured Obama to do that. And those crazies, those crazies, okay, they made Obama do this because he's such a great man, he's such a nice man. And then it blew off and blew back. I mean, I'm listening, and I'm trying to say, I'm trying to find a way to not say it in an insulting way, saying maybe it's the senility. I mean, either you're that, okay, or you are one really nasty, nasty hypocrite that is not, you know, shameful for one second. Because put it in contrast, they made Obama do it. They, I mean, this is this is what happens in the pseudo alternative media outlets. They turn into make it into some puppets in the forefront, not the Operation Gladio B, not the deep state. They make it about personalities. They make it about parties, the war parties. You know, oh yeah, that's the Republicans, the neocons, right? Well, the neocons is the neoliberals who are doing that. And, and, and taking away from the real context, from the real frame, and, uh, and, and 
anyhow, I that just that's just my two cents, and there is no such a thing as blowback. Okay, in this case, <laughs> when we are looking at our perpetual wars, what's happening today? Who's that? <laughs> Nemesis. This this is uh, part of the blowback trilogy that was written by the late Professor Chalmers Johnson. Uh, yes, and. I interviewed him many times, and I have respect for him. And his definition of the term blowback is a little more narrow than the way you're using it. And it is the unexpected or unintended result of covert operations. So I take your point that many of the divide and conquer strategies that are in play today are not accidental. They are intended. And they don't qualify for the term blowback. But I also believe that there are huge American policy blunders, like the ones I cited, that have produced the consequences today. And the, the, the comparison I would use is the movie Hunger Games and, and the books that have been written. And the image of the Hunger Games is this virtual reality zone that is controlled from master control. And they can change the uh, arid desert to a flooding river uh, just by flipping a switch. And I don't believe that the while, while I believe the U.S. aspires to the level of control that uh, is depicted in the fictional Hunger Games, uh, I don't think we have achieved it. And so that's where I parse things a little bit differently. But I don't dispute your basic notion, Sibel, that you know much of what is occurring. And much of what the U.S. will say, oh, shucks, we blew it. Oh, we didn't expect that to happen. Oh, somebody miscalculated. A lot of that is bullshit that is intended to obscure uh, intentional programs and uh, operations that, that are in motion, you know, even as we speak. So I, I, don't, I don't have a deep disagreement with you except I do believe that there are some instances of blowback from policy blunders, some of which were covert, that, that fit the original definition coined by Professor Johnson. No, uh, and I get your points, and I agree with you, and I'm not applying this to everything. I'm applying this narrowly to everything that is related, almost everything in Middle East, in terror, Al-Qaeda, and everything. The only honest policy paper that I have ever seen, okay, period, the most honest one, is PNAC. What was written for Project New American Century? I mean, if everybody, they did all of it like this, so overt and so open and clear, because there, it had nothing to do with beating around the bushes. They were very clear. They said, our goal is this, imperialism, okay? Soviet Union is gone. We have to be the world power, okay? Just I'm um, summing it up, simplifying it. And to achieve it, we got to have something huge happening here. Thousands of people dying. So the stupid majority will line up behind us, cheer for us, and make it possible. I love that. I mean, I love the honesty of that paper. And that is the reality. And the interesting thing is, you never hear people talking about that, PNAC, okay, and that way in CNN or on NPR or on Salon, they like to get those things, mumbo jumbos, you go pages and pages of some policy nobody understands. These people, and these were the real like powerful policy makers in the policy arena, they made it very clear. I love it. You put it like that and everybody understands, but the mainstream media doesn't have an appetite for that, okay? You read that, it's very clear, okay? This is, this is our policy, this is our modus operandi, want to be the world power, who is we? Is that you or me or Yermo? Or is it that, you know, that the, the teacher who's working in high school? Is it 97% of Americans? No. By we, they mean the deep state. They mean the fat cat. They mean the military industrial complex. We want to be the superpower, okay? Colonize the world, take the most, okay? Not leave anything for China, Russia. We want to get everything. In order for it to happen, we have to sacrifice 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, whatever here, and we'll do it because the end justify the means. For who? For those one half a percent or 0.1%. Very clear, very to the point, very honest, 
I wish they made no policies like that and they talked about it like that. Then we wouldn't even have anybody coming on these issues and make up things about, well, as a former CIA analyst, I must say that we really messed that one up and it blew up on our face and we had a blowback, man. You know, we did it in Afghanistan, da, 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 da. Just like Peanut put it out there and there is no room there for second guessing and saying maybe it didn't, you know, they didn't mean that it happened as a result. It's out there for everyone to see. And that is, that is the main premise behind our, all our foreign policies. All our foreign policies are based on that notion. It's a power game, okay? And again, it's not power for the people of any of these nations. It's a power game. And it's the power for the deep state saying how we want to maintain our power, how we want to stay big and get bigger. Has nothing to do with the people, has, not, has nothing to do with you and I, has nothing to do with 99% of the Americans. And the lives of 99% of Americans doesn't mean a lot for those people. If they, if they, when they get, if they feel the need that they need to do something that would kill not 3,000, 500,000 Americans, they would do it in a second. They would do it in a second. You know, there is that country song by Randy Travis, Ants on a Log. I mean, I'm not, and I'm saying it that Ants on a Log. I mean, if, if you listen to it, you know, even though with the cliche country music rhyming, when you have ants, the colonies out there, they don't even, I don't think they know that human exists. They can't look up and see that. They are busy in their own lives and suddenly some foot comes on top of them, right? The shoes, bam, they are gone. They don't even know something big hit them, okay? Who knows how they are interpreting of what killed half of their colonies, that it was something called human being, because they can't really see us, okay? This is how it is with the deep state and the people, okay? The people, 99.999% of the people. And that's, that's the situation. Sabelle, you've once again uh, demonstrated your skill with languages because I don't speak country music. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do want to comment. Uh, I, I do understand your frustration with people like Ray McGovern. Uh, my view is that because he served in the CIA and because he's willing to criticize uh, the agency that he once worked for, and some of our government policies, that he has a legitimate point of view. And I do think that he has added some elements. And I also think that in the recent interview, uh, the focus there was on the victory that he won over the State Department when they uh, brutally ejected him from uh, a, a speech that Hillary Clinton was giving about human rights. Well, I had to cut that short because we don't have much time left, about a minute and a half. And uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, a lot of people think that we should be concerned, if not upset, about the fact that we're being deliberately, systematically dumbed down. I mean, just, just systematically being shaped to worship apathy. Well... I just can't bring myself to really care about that one, but say, did you see the game last night? What was the score? What was the final score? Oh, wait a minute. Dancing with the Stars is on. I'll be back later. Okay, America. Anyway, I'll be back next week, and uh, we might go over some more of the stupid things that voters did this time, like... Uh, Voting for Democrats and voting for Republicans. One of the stupidest things. By now you should know that they are not your friends. Are you stupid? I'll see you Saturday.